Yes, it's now my pleasure to announce um, Juan Gallego, who is a lecturer and research group leader at the Imperial College in London. Um, Juan, can you share your slide or your talk? Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah, let me just open this. It's not, yep. it's not your presentation yet. Of course, my presentation crashed right now. Okay, so this should be good. Are you seeing the yeah, and you're seeing good. the presentation slides? Is it all good? Yeah, great. I can see it. Stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for for being here. And well, I, I should say good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. And thanks for uh, you know joining for my talk, and thanks for uh, to the organizers for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, or they would have been better to be in Canada instead of in my office, but you know, this is how things go. So today I want to tell you a little bit about our work on how we're, you know, how we're leveraging basically our systems neuroscience work to try to advance uh, neuroprosthetics. And actually Rosa's talk before introduced a lot of the things I will be talking about. So, yeah, you know, like in, in my lab, we're very interested in movement, just like a quick overview. Uh, so aspects of skill learning and and, uh, and practice and habits and all these things and we tackle these questions using behavior experiments mostly in mice, uh, also in monkeys, neural recordings, data analysis and computational models. Okay, and today I'm going to be focusing on what we are learning about neuroscience and using to improve brain computer interfaces. So like in the Rosa I gave like a super nice introduction, so I will only. Uh, have to repeat a few concepts. So basically, I will also be talking about the same thing. So we have a subject. In this case, it will be like you know, this lady here who has a youth array implanted in her motor cortex. So it will be recording from hundreds of neurons. And then typically, we use a decoder algorithm that maps the activity of these neurons into a proxy of the subject's intent or motor goals, if you want. And these are used as control signals to move the cursor, as we saw in the a uh, nice previous presentation by Rosa. Okay. So we basically use this, this array. This is how a youth array looks in a primate brain, by the way. And um, yeah, the, the reason that, you know, how this, how this brain machine interfaces work is that basically we record from hundreds of neurons at a time. So here I'm plotting uh, the activity of around 100 neurons recorded with a youth array. So each row is a different column. And um, this, you know, each block is a trial. So the white space indicates that the monkey is reaching to a different target and the color represents how much the neuron is firing. Okay. So you can see that, for example, this neuron here fires more at the beginning than at the, at the end. And this trial fires more and so forth. Okay. And the way we build decoders is we record how the monkey is moving the, the hand at the same time. So this is the velocity of the X and Y axis, what the monkey is doing this joystick uh, base reaching tasks so kids learn to move this yellow cursor to the target okay and they get very good at it so using this we we can build simple decoder algorithms like linear filters or or lstms and we get really good predictions so what i'm plotting in pink is our predictions of how the monkey is moving the hand using this neural activity cross validated and everything okay so very good predictions and the the Neuroscience community has known this for decades, which is why some groups uh, have been able to translate this effort to paralyze uh, individuals. So this is work from Chris National's lab, a really nice paper led by Chetan Pandarinath. And this was until this very same group uh, beat their own record, the best, uh, like very recently in a 2021 paper, this was the best performing BCI ever. So again, this lady has a youth array. They use a decoder algorithm like the one I show you. So she can move this cursor and type. Okay. So this is a video from the paper. And what she's plotting, uh, sorry, what she's doing is, uh, you know, basically typing the lyrics to her favorite song, which is John Lennon's Imagine. So this is real time. And obviously it's not as good as, you know, as, as like typing with these devices, but it still is pretty impressive. and. You can imagine life changing if you are like locked in like these ladies. Okay. 
Um, but these VCS work really well, but they face a challenge that is non-trivial, which is related to the um, technologies that we use to record, as well as uh, how the brain works. So neuroinflammatory reactions when you have a foreign body in your brain. So what I'm showing you here is for 15 randomly electrodes for the Utah array, the neurons were recording from in the one day and a couple of weeks later, okay? So these are the exact same electrodes, and what I'm plotting is the axon potential waveform of each neuron or neurons, like in this electrode, that we recorded in this um, uh, in, in each of these 15 electrodes, okay, out of 100. And if you just like by quick visual inspection, what you realize is that the electrodes that I had lighted in, in yellow only have neurons in one of these two sessions. Okay, and we also did like some analysis uh, using methods from Nikol Hatsopoulos lab to check if the neurons that were in the same electrodes on different days were the same. So we could match, for example, this green and dark blue neuron across days, but we had a neuron that was different. Okay. So the thing is that when we quantify this uh, for all 100 channels in the array for these two pairs of sessions, what we, these pair of sessions, what we realize is that after a couple of weeks, half of the neurons we're recording from are different. And you know, this non-surprisingly uh, decreases over time. So after a month, basically the neurons you are recording from are different. And this is not only our result, this has been known in the community for decades, and as I said, it's probably a byproduct of the foreign body reaction that goes in in the brain, and it can be other uh, phenomena like micro movements of the electrode in the brain. Okay, so what does this mean? What this means is that if you have a, a subject and you give them a very good brain computer interface algorithm, it's going to work fine for a few days, but then for a, after a little bit, when the neurons that are fed into that algorithm are completely different then the VCI will stop working, okay? So if we want to make a product that will help people at their homes for extended periods of time, we need to deal with this challenge of changing neurons, okay? So basically to, to hammer on the details of this uh, problem, um, you know, if you're having like an evening talk with me and uh, are helping yourself to a beer, like, you know, you can imagine that the VCI uh, is, uh, you know, is designed to open a beer. So on day one, the experimenter builds a really nice decoder for you, and this decoder will be like a VR opener, like the perfect tool for the job, right? But after a few days, you will have different neurons as inputs to the decoder that you have at the beginning. So, you know, your VR opener will no longer feel like a VR opener, but it will be another tool that you can kind of use, but it's not as nice as a VR opener, right? The problem is after a month, when the neurons you're recording from are completely different, because you may be facing something like a challenge like of this magnitude, okay? So what I want to, to tell you today is how we use some basic neuroscientific findings from our group to tackle this problem from brain computer interfaces, the problem of having changing neurons in the brain, in, in our brain recordings, okay? So basically, the if you think about it, the, the question we need to uh, 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 answer is, how can we perform the same behavior on different days, right? Like, how does the brain do it? And, uh, you know, how, how are we able, like, how, why do we say that when we learn how to ride a bike as children, we never forget it? Or why do musicians, like, play, you know, learn to play an instrument, and if they don't practice for a while, they still can do it, right? So, um, to, to tell you about our solution, I first have to revisit some of the ideas that Rosa also nicely uh, explained. So, basically, um, you know, like the traditional approach in neuroscience is to focus on what, what each single neuron in the brain does, okay? And the idea is like, you know, the brain is made of billions of neurons. So if I understand what each neuron is doing at any given point in time, and I can kind of like decode the language of neurons in the brain, um, then I will be able to understand the brain. And this is um, hypothesis, this, this hypothesis uh, implicitly assumes that what any given neuron does should be invariant to many things. So this neuron will always, let's say, drive the movement of the hand in this direction, okay? And the way we all apply these methods is that imagine again that we have a monkey doing a similar task. In this case, he's moving the, you know, instead of moving a joystick with the hand by moving the arm, he's just generating force by moving the hand in this device, okay? 
and by generating the force, he can move the yellow cursor to the target, the same as before. And what I'm showing you here is the activity of one of the 100 neurons that we that, that I recorded uh, from this macaque while he was doing this task. And what I'm plotting is the activity on target presentation, then when the movement starts, until the monkey moves the cursor to the target to get a reward. Okay, This is the same neuron, and it's a bit like each of the lines in the plot I showed you before. So here the height represents how much the neuron is firing. Okay. And if you only saw this neuron in the brain, you would conclude that the motor cortex cares about the location of the target in the screen because the height of this peak basically depends on the position of the cursor of the target in the screen, right? But the challenge comes when you record, you, you look at a neuron that I recorded like 400 microns, so very close by, next to this one that looks completely different. And you know, if you plot the 100 neurons, they will look completely different and correlate with different things. And so many people in the motor community have known for years that actually the single neuron representations are very labile. Like you can basically have the monkey doing the task like this or like this, or move the arm to a different position, and these single neuron representations will change. Okay. So what is the alternative idea we're proposing? So this idea of single neuron analysis assumes that each neuron in the brain that I'm representing here as a circle is kind of floating there and can modulate their activity independently to drive movement, okay? But we know that neurons may make thousands of connections to other neurons, and we also know that this connectivity makes neurons work together in specific ways, okay? In other words, the connectivity in the circuit constrains what any given neuron can do independently from the population, okay? So our proposal is very simple, is that we should study this population-wide patterns of neural activity that I'm going to call neural modes instead of what, what each neuron does independently, okay? Um, so you can now be thinking like, oh, Juan has been telling us about this for five minutes and uh, the talk is like, you know, coming to an end. So how, how do we use this philosophical idea almost in experiments? So this is how we do it. Imagine that we're recording from these three neurons in the population. And I told you that we're interested in the population activity in the coordinated population activity, okay? So instead of plotting the activity of each independent neuron, what I'm going to do is plot their coordinated activity in this three-dimensional space in which each axis is the activity of one neuron, okay? And one, two, and three. So basically at any given point in time, the activity of these three neurons will be a point in this space. And now as the monkey is reaching, for example, this point will describe some trajectory in this space, okay? And I could plot all the trajectories when the monkeys are reaching to all the targets and see what happens. And what happens is that I can use a dimensionality reduction method like PCA to ask, does this activity explore the entire space or does it remain confined to a small portion of this space as, as it should if the circuit constrained activity? And the answer is that for all, like across many brain areas and species, and uh, tasks, what we find is that this neural population activity actually lives in a lower dimensional part of the space. So it only explores a tiny bit of this huge dimensional space. And we call this surface a neural manifold, borrowing the term for physics. And it's actually by definition spanned by these neural modes. So what I'm, I know this is very dense if you have never heard these things, but the whole idea is that we can study the coordinated neural population activity, which we propose is how the brain works by adjusting these population activity patterns, by recording from many neurons at the same time, applying a dimensionality reduction method and studying the geometry of the subspace that, or the manifold that underlies this activity and also the activity within the manifold, like this black project, okay? And I introduce all this to show you how we can find something that is stable in the brain when the monkeys do the same task on different days or even years and even if we are recording from completely different sets of neurons okay and that is the key thing so in other words what we have is the monkeys monkeys doing the reaching task with the joystick that i saw at the beginning they have implants in their brains and we're recording, we may be recording from completely different neurons. We don't know that, right? Yeah, right? I show you how the stability of the neural recordings changes. But we have a hypothesis that if it's true, we'll, you know, should reveal that this activity is the same, okay? So now we're with me, and, and this is, are like the next 
the next three minutes of the talk are when you should wake up. Okay? Uh, so now imagine that instead of having a three-dimensional space, I have a space defined by D neurons that where it is like millions of neurons that make motor cortex, for example. Our hypothesis is that when I make this movement or a monkey does this movement, the activity of these millions of neurons in the brain will describe some trajectory in this space. Okay, this is what the population is doing. And we'll and I'm going to call it true latent dynamics because the hypothesis is that after the monkey learns to do this, these dynamics will never change. This trajectory will always be the same and live in some true manifold. Okay. Now my monkey has three electrodes in the brain, and I bring him to the lab and ask him to do this movement. Okay. So the activity of these three recorded neurons will describe some trajectory in this space. But if we are right that there's like some true trajectory that does never change during your life, then this blue trajectory that I record with my electrodes should be some low dimensional projection of this true trajectory, okay? And live in some uh, manifold. But the challenge is that we don't know what, how this three dimensional space is oriented with respect to this million dimensional space, okay? But now, you know, the monkey goes back to his home cage, he hangs out with his friends for a while, and then we bring him back to the lab after a few days. Now my three electrodes may be recording from completely different neurons, um, but if our hypothesis is true again, the activity of these neurons will describe some trajectory that will again be a lower dimensional projection of the same true latent dynamics, okay? Leaving some manifold. So basically, the whole deal is that we, based on our hypothesis of how the brain works, we should be able to just like find a point of view that lets us align these blue and green trajectories that I find by recording from different neurons during the same behavior and reveal that actually the population activity when a, an animal does the same thing remains preserved during months, okay? So this is the moment of truth. This is the, the, the main result of the talk. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is no longer cartoons until, uh, until I've been doing, uh, sorry, as I've been doing until now. But this is the projection onto the first three dimension of this manifold of the population activity, so the activity of 100 neurons, as monkeys reach to different targets. So here you have the colors of the targets, and here you have the trajectories as the monkeys do the different reaching movements. And they start from these dots, so you can see that the dots kind of live here, and then the trajectories are like this curved shapes, okay? This is in day one. Now, one month later, these trajectories look completely different, right? But this is not surprising because we may be recording from completely different neurons, as I told you before. But now the challenge is, can I find some basically rotations that go from, you know, having something like this to revealing that it's actually the same thing. Like if I take my two hands and rotate them now and show that they are the same, okay? So the answer is yes. Just by rotating and stretching this activity, what we find is that the trajectories look remarkably similar. Okay, look at the orange trajectory, for example, the green trajectory, they all start like in this circle and then they uh, span out, okay? So if we quantify the similarity, we get a very high correlation, like 0.7, which is pretty great if you are used to this analysis. And we actually, to know how great this 0.7 is, what we did was take half of the trials uh, you know, taking one session, one half of the trials and compare it to the other half, when we know that the neurons are the same, okay? And we got this value in gray that is slightly bigger, but not much different. So this means that the neural dynamics are as similar, uh, you know, during a month as they are within a session, okay? Even if I'm recording from completely different neurons when I'm looking at two sessions one month apart. And of course, if I don't do this alignment, as I show you here, the trajectories look very different. And this is just to show you that this result holds over a month and a half, that we find very stable latent dynamics as the monkeys do the same task. Now the moment of truth is, can I extend this for longer time periods? So the answer is yes. This is showing that the dynamics are super stable even after two years of the monkey doing this task. And this is for another monkey for whom we have one year and a half of data, okay? So we found a stable correlate of the same behavior that we can uncover when we look at completely different neurons, okay? Now the last part of the talk is, okay, this is cool as a basic scientific result. Can we use it for brain-computer interfaces? So if you remember my original schematic and, and uh, Rosa's talk, 
uh, what we want to do is take this M1 activity and predict how the monkeys move in the hand, for example. So what we did is just use the simplest models we could think of, linear models, and try to see if we could use this aligned latent dynamics to predict behavior with a model trained today and, you know, throughout weeks of recordings, okay? So this is just an example similar to one I showed you before. So these are the trajectories of the hand for a bunch of trials separated with these white spaces. And these are the predictions that we get from a linear model, trained and tested on the same day. So very good predictions as we've known for a while. But now the moment of truth is, can I train a model today and use it a couple of weeks later? And the answer, as you can see now, is yes. I can use a model trained in those latent dynamics and use it after a couple of weeks, and it works as well as it can based on the within-day models, okay? And this is not because there's like some weird voodoo going on, because if, uh, you know, I don't do this alignment and just train a model on the neurons and use it over time, you see that the performance decreases. Like, look at how bad this green model is compared to the blue model, okay? So now again, how does it look for extended periods of time? Again, for, you know, this is a month and a half uh, recordings for this monkey, you see that the within the models are very good, but so are the, align the models based on the aligned dynamics. So I can train, test, so I train a model today and use it one month and a half later and it works perfectly well, okay? Whereas if I don't do the alignment, the model basically becomes useless. So you are actually, if this were like a BCI user, they would be trying to open the beer with their eye, okay? And, and I hope you don't know how hard that is, um, although some of you may. And yeah, just to, to finish, we got the same results for two years. So basically the same decoder worked for two years of data, as you can see here, based on the blue, uh, trace and the same for a year and a half of data. So this is this means that the monkey uses the same latent dynamics to produce the same behavior and also that we can fix this problem that I started with, that the neurons change and therefore the BCI becomes useless, but just sticking our method before the decoder. And actually, Aaron Batista, I and you and Steve Chase's group in this paper by Degenhardt and Bishop use a similar idea to show online performance over a month. Okay, so just to wrap up, I'm sorry for running a bit long, uh, we've told you that a BCI is called promise to restore movement to paralyzed individuals. I've described our pet theory of how the brain works um, and how we can use it to actually reveal that when animals do the same thing, the population activity is the same, which we can uncover even if we record from different neurons. And then with this, we can build a decoder that works well for months, okay? So thanks to you uh, for, for the attention. Thanks to my authors of this paper and my wonderful lab that are doing a lot of awesome work building up on these ideas. And thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much, Juan. Very great, great talk, very interesting. Um, you, yeah, we are already getting the first question. Starts with fantastic talk. Excellent job explaining the conceptually hard neural dynamics. How did you extract the dynamics in the figures you showed, and I forgot to say that is from David Brentman. Question. Okay. okay. Yeah. So David, we 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 could have used LFATS, uh, but we did something super, super similar. We just did PCA. It took the first uh, ten principal components and projected the population activity onto the these ten eigenvectors, and that is are the latent dynamics. If you use LFATS, you will get something that looks a bit better, and the results will not change. I'm sure. Um, and just like, you know, we did a few controls, we tried factor analysis, we are playing with nonlinear methods now, and everything seems to, you know, you can get, uh, you get the same results, essentially. Okay, um, great. I, I have a question. Um, so, so in the beginning, you showed that nice picture, it looked like a dancing scene. Um, so yeah. I mean, then that, that's much more complex. Um, but what do you think how how well the things you showed for these um, quite controlled situations, when will you be able to use them to explain how dancing works? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we have, so basically my postdoc mentor, Lee Miller, who was in the acknowledgements, we started to build like a, this um, plastic uh, home cage where we could record during uh, free behavior from macaques for uh, several days, like using everything like wireless and movement tracking. So I know his group, like a number of people are working on that already. There's a few other labs. 
uh, recording from uh, freely moving macaques already, like with implanted brain electrodes, movement tracking. Uh, so people are making a lot of progress. We want to do something like this in rats when, like soon-ish. Um, and yeah, I think the, the idea should hold, like we have some uh, preliminary results that I think are promising, like uh, looking at applying them to find manifolds, for example, during less constrained behaviors. Okay, um, so it's... Yeah. Yeah, so, so you think that the, the same, like, analysis methods would, would work for something? Yeah, because I think uh, so far these ideas are, like, you know, holding <laughs> up, but um, I think we may have, like, some challenges, like, if the set of behaviors is very large, then this activity will not be, like, you know, exploring only this tiny part. Imagine that this is the space of all potential activity patterns. So, of course, if it's a monkey doing this, it will explore this bit. And if it's a monkey dancing ballet, it will explore all this. So maybe to reconstruct them, we will need like electrodes that record from many more neurons than a hundred. Um, okay. So I think that is one challenge. And the other, just to finish up with my thoughts, is that we may need to record from many brain areas if we want to understand like very complex skills that will require, yes. you know, more than moving your arm. <laughs> Okay, maybe we take one last question, which is how, how many electrodes we need uh, to hope for stable principal component detections to maintain stable decoding over long term. Okay, so yeah, I think. Arash, Arami. Yeah, thanks, Arash, for the question. I think it depends on the task that you want to perform. So if if it's like something like moving a cursor in the screen or Chris Nationalist group is doing now. Um, has a really nice paper showing uh, decoding of intended handwriting. So a person is trying to to write like this. Uh, so I think for this, a few hundred electrodes seem to be enough because we it will be decoders with more neurons. After a few times, we we don't get anything better. But again, if you want to do like more complex behaviors, then we will need more neurons. Um, so I think it depends on that complexity, basically. Okay, good. Um, th there's one more question in the chat, which you may want to answer, um, but I think we have to move on um, because of timing. So thank you very much again for your presentation. Okay. And um, I and I have I'm handing back to John McPhee for chairing the last talk. Great, thanks, Katya. Um, great talk, excellent talk. Thank you, Juan. Uh, and uh, now I ask uh, Massimo Sartori to share his screen with us. We make sure it's working. And it gives me great sure. pleasure to introduce Dr. Sartori. We, we see your slides, they look great. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, take it away, thank you. Thank you very much. So, well, hi everyone. Uh, again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And again, thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, well, I'd like to give an overview of, of a specific research line, a little bit of um, maybe a little bit of a new research line in, in my lab. So I'll summarize um, results from, from a few studies in about 20 minutes with an emphasis on two major applications, uh, robotic exoskeletons and but also spinal cord stimulation. So, well, I hope that my talk will be will be clear enough for you and I'm looking forward to to, to any question in this in this regard. Um, well, in, in, in my lab, we're, we're very much interested in, in the challenge of, of uh, restoring human movement after, after a neuromuscular injury. It can be a brain lesion, it can be a spinal cord lesion. And a major problem here um, is that it's, it's essentially difficult to predict how the human body responds to external interventions. So when we connect our body to, to a robotic device, it could be an exoskeleton or it could be even even a neurostimulator, we essentially expose biological tissues in our body to, to electrical and to mechanical stimuli. And if exposed over a long period of time, all the structural compositions of this tissue may actually change. Like for instance, prolonged mechanical strain delivered to skeletal muscle may lead to structural changes in fascicle length or muscle volume. Uh, similarly, electrical uh, stimuli to the spine may actually alter the excitability of the spinal cord. 
and and whether or not this 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 changing uh, this changes improve the way we move in the long term well it's difficult to predict and 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 that's the key point um if we could actually predict how the body responds and if we could steer uh, robotically these responses over time to induce a positive change in the future then i think that we could really talk about closed loop rehabilitation and and, and that's one of the major challenges in and uh, uh, that we want to tackle in in my lab um and this challenge really highlights um well the variable nature of of, of the human body uh it really highlights the human body as as a time varying system undergoing uh, again structural adaptations over time at multiple spatial scales from the cellular scale to the tissue to the organ scales right so the human body is is, is highly variable in its uh, in its uh, in its tissue uh, structure but this also highlights the fact that current robots interact with the body with little knowledge of of such adaptation in in in, in space and time and this is a major element hampering progress of robot driven rehabilitation right so to 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 address this this issue in my lab we work on uh delivering well creating a framework that we can essentially use to deliver electrical and mechanical stimuli to different parts of the body and uh, the idea is to develop uh, multi-scale predictive models that we can use to essentially predict how the body responds to electromechanical stimulation um, and, and then to incorporate these models into control loops so that we can essentially tell uh, how to steer uh, 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 the stimuli to, to lead the body towards a predefined target which should uh, ideally improve um, uh, human movement um and to do this we work on three major pillars we work on on recording the activity of neural cells involved in the control of movement in a clinically viable way and we do a lot of work on, on linking how this neural information actually translates into mechanical information and then the idea is to use these two steps to create uh, new ways of controlling wearable robots such as exoskeletons uh, prosthesis but also uh, spinal cord stimulator so um in this talk, I'd like to give a snapshot of each of these three pillars. Uh, actually, most of my talk will focus on short time scales, so predicting neuromuscular responses within seconds and minutes. Uh, but in the final part, I'd like to introduce some preliminary, very preliminary results on how we can actually probe responses on, on longer uh, 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 time scales. Uh, all right, so let's go back to the short time scale and let's go, let's start with pillar one. Um, and I think this will be also introduced a little bit more in details tomorrow, but a clinically viable way to interface with the nervous system, it, you know, we could also use electronic skins to basically record the bioelectrical activity produced by, by many muscle fibers in skeletal muscles. And the important point here is that skeletal muscles are physically innervated by alpha motor neurons, which are neural cells in the spinal cord. And because of this very safe synaptic connection, there is basically a one-to-one -one relationship between action potentials triggered in the alpha motor neurons and action potentials triggered in the innervated fibers. So in principle, this interference signal, this EMG signal that you measure from the muscle, in principle, it contains information about uh, alpha motor neurons activity. And using um, advanced signal processing, actually blind source separation, you can actually decompose this interference signal and reveal the time events at which different neurons fire in the control of this uh, skeletal muscle. So what you get is a sort of barcode like this, where every column is a neuron and every vertical line tells you whether or not that neuron is firing. So this is powerful, right? Because you can record from the muscle, but you can look into, into, the, into the spinal cord activity. Um, and an example of how we're using this, this technique comes from, from a recent study. Um, we had four incomplete spinal cord injury patients um, with injury levels ranging from C4 to C8. And we recorded high density EMGs from, from the calf muscles. Uh, during isometric plantar, uh, plantar flexions. And then we decomposed the signals to reveal, to reveal the firing activities of the underlying alpha motor neurons. 
so in this way, you can basically infer neural activities across different lumbosacral levels of the spines, which are the levels where these neurons from different muscles in the calf are, are, are located. And in this study specifically, we were interested in, in, uh, in looking whether this approach could be used to investigate neural response to electrical stimuli. So we use transpinal electrical stimulation to deliver weak currents to the lumbosacral regions of the spine. And we wanted to see if this information could actually be a reliable source of, uh, uh, to really probe neural response. Um, and what we did was essentially extracting a frequency domain feature, we call it coherence, which is, if you want, this is kind of the correlation in the frequency domain between all possible pairs of spike trains. Um, actually, before doing that, what we did was actually, we developed a, a quality control algorithm that we used to remove all the units that, that were kind of labeled as, as noisy. And this is very important for extracting robust features. So uh, we used um, specific thresholds on uh, coefficients of variations and pass to noise ratio extracted from uh, discharge rates of these motor units. And then we rejected motor units that um, didn't, uh, that were uh, greater than or, or lower than these specific thresholds. But because the activity of alpha motor neurons is highly, highly connected to, to, to force production, we removed units only if this removal uh, improved the correlations uh, with force. So this is actually um, the filtered cumulative spike trains and how well it, it, it resembles force. Um, so in this way, we were left with a number of, of motor units that were dynamically consistent. So motor units that really explained the mechanical force that was measured during the experiment. And then we computed the coherence uh, across all these uh, possible pairs of decoded um, spike trains. And uh, what we found was uh, that uh, the coherence in the delta band, so in the low frequency, actually decreased immediately after the stimulation. So every subject was uh, un underwent a stimulation uh, 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 training for about 10 minutes. And after that, we a probed coherence uh, and we call this T0 and we saw a decrease in the coherence in the delta band. But we also found that this decrease in the coherence was actually long lasting. So it lasted uh, up to 30 minutes and that's what this graph is showing. So here we can see how the coherence in the delta band decreases immediately after the stimulation as well as 30 minutes later. And the graph also shows that when we administered a sham stimulation, like sort of placebo stimulation, coherence did not show any, any, any change. So this is promising because we can use this signal feature to probe neural responses and is a good starting point for developing closed loop um, stimulation techniques in the, uh, for the future. All right, so once we can interface with the nervous system, we can uh, measure neural responses at the, at the alpha motor neuron level. The next step is to understand how this neural response uh, is, is connected with uh, the, uh, the muscular response in the musculoskeletal system. Uh, so the idea here is to essentially translate these discrete firing events into, into estimates of the resulting torques, mechanical forces produced by the innervated muscles. And, and for the accurate translations of neural information into mechanical information, well, the first thing to do is to estimate the, the twitch properties, the contractile properties of each of these units. So we want to, we want to tell how, how fast is, is this specific unit, how slow is this other one, how fatigable is this one. And again, I'm gonna show you some preliminary results in this direction. So in this study, this time we had healthy subjects only. They were instructed to track um, a reference plantar dorsiflexion torque profile which was displayed visually, spanning a large repertoire of, of, of contraction types. So from 20% all the way to 90% of, of the maximal voluntary contraction. Um, and for all the muscles in the calf, we decoded uh, the motor unit activity across all these MVC levels. And we then extracted, again, two features. We extracted the um, discharge rate 
and the recruitment threshold of each specific motor unit, and then we plotted them together. So in this graph, every dot represents a motor unit uh, being recruited with this threshold and firing with the specific discharge rate. Um, so these are all the motor units decoded from the Tibialis anterior during this repertoire of tasks. And, and then what we did was essentially computing a first principal component, and then we projected this linearly combined feature onto this eigenvector. And this gave us a sort of histogram like that, um, which essentially gives us a sort of probability distribution of the firing characteristics of, of the motor units of the Tibialis anterior. Um, and for the Tibialis anterior, we found that basically we could kind of characterize two major populations of mono units that had distinctive firing characteristics. And this was actually true also for not only for the tibialis anterior, but also for all the other muscles in the uh, in the calf. And the idea is that now we can use basically discharge rate and firing threshold to, to basically tell where a specific unit moves along this, this axis. And based on that, we can estimate the likelihood of this unit to belonging to these populations or to this population. And based on that, we can then uh, tune a twitch model. Uh, in this case, we are, we are calibrating, for example, the activation constant. So the time for the twitch to reach, for the twitch model to reach peak um, activation, but also, for it, but also the, the half relaxation time, so the deactivation time. So in this way, we can give speed character characteristics to each of these uh, discrete firing events that we uh, decoded from the previous step. So, and the idea is that we, we, we can now use these motor unit specific twitch models to, to, to basically translate these discrete events into continuous signals that we can use to drive forward subject specific models of the musculoskeletal system. And, and, and in this way, we can finally convert uh, neural information into into mechanical information. We can we can translate these firing events into into muscle force and into joint torques, uh, hopefully with high level of accuracy. This is an example of how we can translate motor neurons uh, firing uh, uh, patterns into torque. These are all all the MVC conditions that we investigated from 20% to 90%, and this is. Uh, an anatomy here, it means that the ankle joint was in anatomical position. But what we did in the study, we also investigated these translations of neural into mechanical information when the ankle was dorsiflexed or, uh, sorry, dorsiflexed or plantar flexed. And doing this is important because different joint angles bring muscle fibers to operate at different fascicle lengths. And uh, operating at different fascicle lengths, it means that the capacity of that fascicle to generate force changes, right? And taking this into account is, is really important for this kind of neural decoding of torque because in principle, even, even if the neural command would be the same, if the fascicle length changes, you could have a completely different mechanical output coming out of the muscle. And that's what we are doing with this framework. We're trying to, cons to take into account neural and muscular properties for the robust decoding of torque. And that's what we try to demonstrate in this initial study. Um, and robust decoding of torque from neural information, it's important for pillar three. So interfacing robots with the human body and in a robust and intuitive way. So this brings me to, to the third pillar of this, of this presentation. And, and I would like to, to, to show how this approach, uh, how we've been using this approach in the context of exoskeleton control. And so the idea is pretty much the same. The idea is to record bioelectrical information uh, to translate these information into a high fidelity estimate of the biological forces produced in the muscle so we can understand how weak or how strong a specific subject is. And then based on that, we can tell the exoskeleton how to support the subject. Uh, disclaimer in the next slide here, we, we are not, I'm gonna show you results only based on low density EMG. So we are not using high density EMG in these studies yet. Uh, so in a couple of years ago in 2019, we applied this approach to stroke patients and incomplete spinal cord injury patients. This is a hemiparetic stroke subject uh, controlling exoskeletons using this model-based 
EMG driven model based approach. This is an incomplete spinal cord injury patients, although there's very little residual movement, the patient was able to, to control plantar dorsiflexion and also uh, knee flexion extension. And when the subject was wearing the exoskeleton, he could also, well, he could achieve larger range of motions, larger uh, angular velocity in the ankle and in the knee. But what we're doing right now is to translate these methods to locomotion, which is a more challenging task. So these are, this is a recent study only involving healthy subjects, five healthy subjects, walking using a bilateral ankle exoskeleton over a treadmill. And what we did was um, we dynamically changed walking conditions. So we changed walking speed and we also changed the ground elevation. So the subjects, they walked in a single session, half an hour, across six different walking conditions uh, in a single uninterrupted session. Subject walked first uh, in one session when, when the exo was controlled in minimal impedance. So the exo was essentially transparent. It was not assisting locomotion. And in another session, they were receiving assistance based on this EMG driven modeling approach. Um, again, this is the same graph, but it just shows the model output. So uh, this is the biological torque predicted by our uh, model. And this is the assistive torque given by the exo. And you can see that the biological torque in the assisted case is lower than the biological torque in the non-assisted case. So this again shows that we can control to a certain extent the biological torques produced by the human body during walking using a model-based approach. These are some more comprehensive results uh, showing a biological torque reduction between non-assisted and the assisted scenario. Again, these are the three ground elevations at 2.8 kilometers per hour. These are the same three ground elevations at 1.8 kilometer per hour. This is reductions of torque during the transitions ac across these this, this conditions. And this is the reduction throughout the entire experiment. So again, this is promising because it shows that the exo is really synced with, with the neuromuscular system. Again, these are more, these are the same results that highlights the continuity of the experiments. On the X axis, we have all the gait cycles. The subject walked on the treadmill and every dot represents the RMS of the torque uh, in a given gait cycle. And you can see that, that the dots in the assisted condition, they are lower than the dots in the non-assisted condition. So again, this is promising because it shows that the exo can operate in concert with the human body almost as an artificial muscle controlled by the nervous system. Um, in this study, we also found that this approach enables subjects to perform dexterous uh, lower limb tasks, such as moonwalking, for example. And moonwalking is, is tricky because the coactivations of the muscle is really unusual. There are high interaction forces exchanged between the body, the exo, and the environment. And is a, is a challenge for the high level and low level control of the exo. This is a video that shows how we actually controlled these uh, moonwalking experiments. These again are our torques estimated uh, uh, from, from our model. And um, again, during such a complex and, and different unusual movement, we were able to control the exo in such a way that, that it would nicely coordinate with biological muscles and reduce EMG activity, uh, therefore providing a biomechanical benefit. So again, this is a promising result that these methodologies, they, 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 they can provide um, robustness levels. All right, this is the last part of my presentation and I'd like to spend a few minutes to outline some preliminary work um, aimed at investigating body adaptations across larger time scales. And there are basically two ways of doing this. You can conduct in vivo studies or in vitro studies. In vivo studies, studies are really good to probe organ scale adaptations across time, and that's what, what we're doing. But in vitro studies, at least in, a, in, a, in an early stage, are really good because they give you high resolution into the tissue and the cellular scale across temporal scales. And that's what I would like to, to, to focus on in this presentation, actually. Um, this is actually a collaboration between European projects, and the idea is to grow muscle tissues on a chip. Um, 
so uh, we have we have a chip is is pretty small. It's eight by five millimeters, and in this chip we can basically locally tune uh, the me the mechanical and the chemical environments, uh, and and therefore influence in a highly controlled way how these muscle tissues develop over time, and we can almost control this development in closed loop by changing the mechanical and the chemical properties of of, of this environment. And that's really this muscle on a chip technology is really the expertise of Professor Jeroen Rokema and 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 the PhD candidate Jena Zhang, who's been leading the development of this muscle on a chip, together with Pablo Kopp and Sasha Chigoya from my lab. Um, uh, but yeah, so the idea is to is to uh, place a solution, a cell gel solution composed of uh, fibrin and myoblast cells taken from mice, we have about 1 million cells per chamber. And typically these cells, they react to the mechanical stimuli provided by these by this by this cantilevers. And over time, they basically reorganize into, into muscle fibers. You can actually see this process here when the tissues, they, where, where the cells, they, 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 they become more and more compact and they form muscle fibers. And again, the, uh, we can tune the mechanical properties, for example, the stiffness of this cantilever, the width, the distance, so that we can actually change the mechanical stimuli provided to the cells. These are some uh, results uh, from, our, from our studies, so how this initial solution develops into, into muscle tissues. And what we're doing is using imaging techniques uh, to basically look at the structural compositions of these muscle fibers across time. So in this study, we kept tissues alive for about 30 days, for about a month. And then we can basically stain different filaments. In this case, we are staining actin filaments, which are which, which is one of the three major proteins, proteins of sarcomeres, which are the major contractile elements of muscles. And we can start and count uh, the number of actin filaments, the geometrical arrangement, and we can use this to really build cause-effect relationships between uh, acting and, but also myosing and hopefully also tightening geometrical arrangement and mechanical force produced by this tissue. And the idea is to use this data to, to, to create predictive models that we can use to predict how cellular level reorganization leads to changes in tissue and organ level function. All right, so this is, my last slide, uh, just to wrap up, um, I showed some initial achievements in my lab for developing technologies that we can use to interact with biological tissues in the nervous system, but also in the muscular system. And the idea really is really to start and think about a unified control framework that we can use to coordinate different type of robotic technologies to interact at different levels of the neuromuscular system and essentially trigger and stimulate tissue remodeling over time. And I think this, if we can do this in a closed loop way, then I think this will open avenues for, uh, well, repairing neuromuscular damage in a large variety of conditions, but also, for example, predicting likelihood of injuries ahead of time, and maybe even preventing injury onset in very highly dynamic tasks, or even throughout aging stages. So that's a little bit of our vision. Um, again, this is my, uh, well, I'd like to acknowledge the people in, in my team, the funding, uh, 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 the funding bodies. Uh, these are the people that contributed to the results that I showed. And with this, I'd like to conclude my talk and, and thank you for, for your attention. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Sartori. Um, you know, really, that was such a great talk to wrap up our session. Um, because it so nicely bridged the gap between uh, some of the neural presentations we've seen and the more biomechanical presentations that we saw earlier this morning. So really, really a great job bridging the gap between those two domains. Um, Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so if you, anybody has any questions, you can type them into the Q&A or directly into the chat. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by your work. Maybe I can start off. Uh, with a question about real-time implementation of these new controllers that rely upon a combined neuromusculoskeletal model. Do you, do you see any challenges there in achieving real-time capability of these new model-based controllers? 
Yeah, I see challenges and I also see some opportunities. Of course, uh, I think you you also touched upon this these topics in in your in your uh, presentations. And of course, the more this model be become complex, so the more the, the more the higher the complexity in this in this in these models, the more the the more challenging it is to actually operate them in real time and even to identify some of the of the parameters in a in a robust way. Um, so what we're doing in our lab is we are we start from very accurate mechanistic models that can that represents as best as possible the neuromuscular system. Uh, but then uh, we also use surrogate model techniques to actually generate uh, surrogate models that can approximate the input output relationship of some of these smaller components. And these surrogate models are typically very fast because they rely on closed form equations and that can be computed very fast in real time. So an example, for example, is typically the musculoskeletal geometry is, is, is very time consuming because, you know, it's about representing the 3D shape of muscles, how they wrap around bones and and you could essentially you know create surrogate models of this by using multi-dimensional splines for example um i think artificial neural networks uh or nonlinear regression in general can also be used to approximate the input output relationship of some other components um to be some twitch models sometimes that can become very nasty in terms of equations and so it could be it could be handy to, to to create surrogate models of this. Um, so this is some of the um, of yeah of, of the techniques that we've been using so far to try to have comprehensive models that at the same so physiologically plausible models that at the same time can also operate in real time. Um, and and so far it's been it's been um, I think we had some 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 promising results and and. Um, so far, this is our 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 strategy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're we're kind of over the time, but there is one more question I'd like to ask you. It's from Arash Rami, yeah. and he asks if you see a need for continuously using high density EMG for closing the loop, or high density EMG would be more suitable for evaluating and designing electrical stimulations, and then using a low density to close the loop. That's a very nice question. So I I think that uh, this really depends on advances in wearables, in wearable technology and advances in electro technologies. Uh, what I am, what I am uh, noticing is that there's a lot of innovation going on into um, textile based electro, stretchable electronics, um, the possibility of embedding this electronic into wearable garments. We're actually developing some sensorized garments in our lab as well. So I think in the future we can really talk about having smart clothing that can actually measure uh, bioelectrical potential throughout the body. So in my opinion, um, it's a matter of time, and I think this this multi-channel high density technology will become more and more viable um, together with these advances in, in in wearable technologies. And I think that this will also provide benefits because. If you can, uh, if you can get rid of action potentials, which are very noisy and unstable over time, and you could just use firing events, then you could have a much more robust signal over time, and um, and this could have very large impact in closed loop control applications. Excellent, thank you. So uh, thank you again to Dr. Sartori for his wrap up talk today. Thanks for everybody thank for you. listening. And uh, Ning, I turn it back to you in case you have any closing comments. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, John uh, and uh, Katya for uh, moderating today's session. And I think it's a nice mixture. And uh, indeed, uh, Massimo's, uh, Massimo's talk actually sort of uh, closed the loop <laughs> uh, so to say, so uh, linking the biomechanical aspect and the neural um, aspect together. So I think it's a very good session uh, this morning. Uh, well, this morning for uh, for me, and um, and for the audience still here, uh, we will be starting tomorrow uh, again at nine o'clock. Uh, and again, uh, just to remind you, the talk, uh, the topics of tomorrow's uh, for tomorrow's session is mainly um, uh, brain computer interfaces. So hopefully, we'll see some of you. Um, uh, in the uh, in the session for tomorrow.
And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank again for the speakers and the audiences uh, here today. And uh, I would like to close the session for today. And thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Okay.